Uh, up next, we have uh, another wonderful speaker, uh, Shinjini Kumar, co-founder MySol's app, and she will be delving into building a successful fintech startup from idea to execution. Shinjini, may we request you to come up on the dais? Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Shinjini, talking on Founders Pivot on building a successful fintech startup. Stage is yours. Hi. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me here. I don't intend to use a presentation. I don't intend to talk a lot about fintech or fintech ecosystem. I'll talk for five minutes about what we are doing and why we are doing and why we think it is necessary to do what we're doing. And I'll spend 10 minutes talking to you and having you ask me any questions. Um, I don't know how much of my introduction has made its way to anyone. So apart from the fact that I'm a co-founder of a company called MySaltApp, and that's my photo, does anybody know anything more about me here in the audience? Anyone? Okay, you know something about me. What do you? Okay, anybody else knows anything about me? Okay, so I can start with my introduction then because that's just curtsy. Uh, so I have worked in financial services in India for 30 years before I started this uh, company. And uh, my introduction to financial services was a little bit strange at the age of 21. Um, I was a young English literature student wanting to, really raring to go and become a journalist. That was the you know big dream that I had. And then my brother, who was like all Bihari, we are Bihari kids, so my brother, like all good Bihari kids, was writing the civil services exam. And so he challenged me to write the civil services exam, and I said, I'm not going to deviate from my dream. I only want to become a journalist. And he said, why do you want to become a journalist? And I said, because I want to live in a city, because I, we lived in a small place. So he said, write the RBI exam, and you will only live in a city. That was my introduction to finance. So I went. I took up whatever it needed to take to the examination center and wrote the exam. Um, I happened to become a journalist after that, so I went into Times of India uh, in Delhi. I was very happy. I thought Delhi was a city, but it wasn't. So six o'clock we had to be back to the uh, apartment where we were living um, because otherwise you would be lynched in the bus. So it was like, oh my God, I worked so hard to come here, but it wasn't still a city. And then uh, RBI you know, takes you through multiple layers of examination. I somehow passed all of that, and then I got an appointment letter from RBI. Now, RBI doesn't send you an appointment letter that says, hello, welcome to Reserve Bank of India, like, you know, nice appointment. They send you one list which says following candidates have qualified to become whatever, and these are your centers for places. Now, the name against my name was, the city against my name was Bangalore. If it had been Bhopal, you wouldn't have had me in financial services. Maybe I would have been a journalist. So I said, Bangalore, okay, that's the next city. Let's go there. So I, that's how I joined the Reserve Bank of India. And I worked there for not one or two or three or four years. I worked there for 17 years. So 17 years, I was a bank supervisor. I used to handle FDI in India in the 1990s. That became my MBA because I could see everything that was there to be seen about the economy. I used to give people approvals for making royalty payments. I used to give people approval for share transfer, technology transfer agreements, share issuances, et cetera, et cetera. So I learned a whole lot of finance I had to. But then I realized I still didn't know what M1 was and what M3 was and what the governor kept talking and I didn't understood half of it. So I decided to go to the US and do a master's degree. And I came back all charged up. But anyway, uh, I gave up on that dream because I got a transfer to Bombay. I came here and this was a very big city and it made me feel very bad about being a bureaucrat, which wasn't the case in Delhi. So I decided that let's try other things. So that's how my life uh, journey happened. 17 years in the Reserve Bank of India, 17 years outside the Reserve Bank of India, starting with Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Then I was a partner at PricewaterhouseCoopers. I set up the something called, uh, I used to head banking and capital markets and I set up something called the inclusive finance practice. The reason I'm telling you this is because if you want to, uh, when I share you the story of what we are building and why we are building, I think some of this will put it in the context. And so I, um, yeah, and it was Raghuram Rajan's tenure. Rajan's one dream was to take, uh, make finance more uh, inclusive, to broad-based finance in this country. 
I could really resonate with that. I, I built a lot of, uh, you know, I built a practice around that. I made a lot of money. And um, the company, um, you know, there were a lot of companies wanting to become banks at that point of time. Paytm was one of them. As it happened, they got the license. I became the CEO for their bank, which is one thing that somebody knows here. But I left that soon after to go to Citibank. I used to head Citi's Consumer Bank for India, which I left to start this company called Salt. It's a long story, but that's just because I'm old. So that's, here we are. Now, what are we doing at SALT, and why is it that I thought it was important enough for me to leave whatever I was doing um, and, and do this? It's because uh, my, I had some slides where I just wanted you to see the faces of my co-founders, but then the slides are not working, so I will give up on that um, uh, because I, it, I just got them late, and in this building, which is called GEO, ironically, the network isn't always good. So um, we experienced that during the GFF because uh, we always have this problem. You can't set up appointments, whatever. So anyway, so uh, my co-founder, Chaitra Chidanand, who was the co-founder of a company called uh, Get Simple, which was India's first buy now, pay later company, and I know her from that time. She came up with this idea of uh, saying, you know, I want to build something in the space of uh, women and finance uh, using technology. And I thought, one fine day I said, yes, why not? Let's do that. So uh, she and I got together. And I figured that, okay, now I'm going to tell you the story of the startup because I'm here to talk about building a startup. So just be with me. So why did I leave a job to start this? Is because when Chaitra gave me this idea of what she wanted to build, her question was that, why is it that women who are microfinance beneficiaries are able to deal with their money and educate their daughters and children and you know build a reasonable amount of uh, money and life for themselves, but why is it that middle class women do nothing with their money? And typically just, even if they earn, they give the agency to make decisions about their money to their husbands, brothers, fathers, chartered accountants, whatever. So it kind of resonated with me because the only reason that I'm as good with my personal finance as I am is because I married a poet and he wouldn't do anything. He couldn't do anything. He doesn't understand anything. And I said, Hmm, this guy is educated. He has a PhD from United States of America. He did quantitative courses. He's smart, but he doesn't do anything with his money. And maybe this is the same story for everybody's wives. They don't do anything with their money. And that causes anxiety, especially during COVID. You must remember that all of this conversation was happening in 2020. Um, when you know COVID had already happened, our, I was at City. We had put our team of 4,000 people to work from home. There's a whole amount of very different type of stress. But every day you were also bombarded by stories of families being destroyed because people were dying, they were sick, there was so much anxiety around everything. And money somehow has a tendency to creep into every aspect of your life. You don't like to think that it is like that, but unfortunately it is. Um, so, so, you know, a lot of these became money conversations, like somebody's in the hospital, they have the money, but their wife can't pay the bill because she doesn't know where the money is and stuff like that. So, uh, so at one point of time, I told my mother, who was also in a hospital, she had had a cancer surgery and I was with her and I told her, you know, my friend wants to do this. And she said, and I said, I, I think I should do something like this. And she said, why aren't you doing it? And I said, hmm, maybe I need a little more money for myself before I do this. And she said, how much money do you need? So I told her some number. And she said, you know, she'd lived a good enough life with maybe two or three zeros removed from the number that I had in mind. And so she said, if you want to do it, then do it. Then money should not be on your way. So, you know, when you feel strongly about something is when you do it. Don't just do it because a startup is a way to uh, you know, become whatever, rich, famous, uh, do it because, because it's going to be very stressful after that. It is still is stressful, right? Um, and, and therefore, you, need, you will need that mission, that power to take you through this. So therefore, that's important. The second thing that's important is finding the right people to do it with. So for me, Chaitra was that co-founder. I'd known her. I had trust in her. I had trust in her abilities. Uh, she's a Stanford graduate. She's worked on machine learning, AI, et cetera, et cetera. And so I thought, oh, yeah, I know finance. She knows technology. Let's just do this. And then we started talking. And then I realized that, yeah, she knows technology. I know finance. But 
I almost agree with everything she says on technology, and she almost agrees with everything I see, uh, say on finance. And so there's nobody who's going to challenge us. So we need another co-founder. And that's how we talk to Aditi. Aditi is somebody we both knew, and um, Aditi is uh, uh, much younger, much smarter than all of us, and she can question anybody. So we said, okay, this is the right combination. She used to head product at Paytm. She was wor already working in a startup. She'd worked in Goldman Sachs in early stage investing. So she had a very well-rounded uh, CV to fill in that. So between founders, I think it's an important thing for you to develop that understanding, to understand uh, what strengths, et cetera. But then we were still not ready for it because I was leaving a job, Aditi was leaving a job, for Chaitra, it was her second startup, so she had learned a lot of lessons from her first one. So we spent a good, um, you know, I should say four to five months uh, just talking about the three of us and why we want to do this and what is our best case scenarios with each other, what is our worst case scenarios with each other, what is, what is it that we like about each other, what is it that we don't know about each other, what is it that we would like to put it, uh, each other through, and we documented that. So we have... If nothing else, we'll have a handbook on how to you know, find your co-founders. So we went ahead and we did all these conversations and we figured out what were, what were, so my nightmare scenario, for example, was that people would be deferential to me and therefore, and I would come with a baggage of old style uh, knowledge and therefore I may not be always thinking right and who's going to challenge that. That was my nightmare. And then, and I realized that, of course, in retrospect, I realized that was not right because I got challenged enough. But uh, so similarly for everyone, there were different things. So, so we found the right people to do it with. And then the next challenge is to build the team, right? Because none of us were the people who would sit and code the product. So we started to build that. And the kernel of our team came from our past acquaintances. So Chaitra's ex-team members, that's how you then begin to build the team. Because we came from this background, I think we also spent a lot of our time trying to, around our mission, around our culture, around building that right organization. The reason it was important is because it's not easy to think about women as consumers of financial services. Like I just told you, it's a very hard thing. It's a very hard thing to convince investors. It's a very hard thing to uh, convince each other. And, um, but we were very uh, committed to that idea. But we also realized when these young people who came, particularly men who started to challenge us saying, what makes you think that only women have a problem with financial services? A lot of young men also have similar attitude towards banks and these boring apps. So why don't we build for a more universal audience? So that, that kind of opened up our TAM. And so it's been a story of learning and building and learning and building. And uh, where we are today is that we have a wonderful app and I, really, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to talk about it because all you need to do is to download. It's at my.sol.app slash download. Download the app. We have something, we, we help you to track your money, save and invest. When you track your money, we have a NLP based tool where, which is also, you know, account aggregator enabled. So we show you wh where your money is going, where it's coming from, what do you have left to invest or do you need a credit or whatever you can do. We allow you to personalize it. So for example, Aditi's dog is called Jamun. So she has trained her model to, ex to every time she says Jamun, it gets classified as pet care. But if I say Jamun, it gets classified as a fruit. So we've, the, the model is very smart. It has been fed millions of data points. It's got all of Sephora Beauty and all of uh, 1MG into its database. So you can say whatever you like and the NLP picks it up and classifies it properly. So it's a very, fairly powerful tool along with the account aggregator. We help you save in digital gold and we help you invest in direct mutual funds. That's our promise is that we help you become confident with your money as you go into your journey. It's a transparent platform. It allows you to see what you're doing. It allows you to learn on the way. We also give you one-on-one. -on -one, so we have a real human being who picks up your phone. So, uh, so that's where we are right now in the journey. I'm not going to uh, talk more. I will just keep an, a minute and a half that I have for any questions that I have. If people can ask two or three questions, I'll try to answer them all at once. No questions? Sure, a good question. So I actually had it on the slide. So our first uh, thing very strongly was to uh, understand who these users will be, right? Because we were going into a territory that was not traditionally a financial services consumer. So uh, our first thing started by doing user surveys. So we would call uh, people that we knew. 
uh, initially, and we would have long conversations with them about money. What do we do? What do you do with your money? Where do you keep it? Da, 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 da. It would start for 15 minutes, go on till 45 minutes. And most of the time, we realized that those women will end up referring some other woman and say, hey, I really learned from this conversation. Will you talk to so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so? That circle expanded to become 500 people until the such point where we couldn't cope with it. So we realized, let's productize it. So our first product was something called the money personality test, which you might have seen on social media because about 300,000 people have already taken that test. And that test came out of this uh, thing. And the first people were, became who users were overnight, like some 10,000 people because we put it on Twitter and it got picked up by a few people. So that's how it happened. But after that, we went on Instagram and we would curate audiences and uh, push it out to them. And that's how it kind of kept hitting that number. But those were, the, those were still the people who were using this. Once we built the app, then a lot of the people who had that brand recall and that understanding of that, hey, these are the people who understand my money personality and they, uh, they, have, they built something for me. Uh, so it wasn't hard for us initially to get users on the app because there was a fair bit of that history built. We were also doing workshops with uh, and collaborations with communities of uh, other uh, women. And so within that, and, and you know, we would make a money club on WhatsApp. So there was a fair bit of, um, you know, um, traction uh, on top of which this uh, app, when it happened, it got. But the, what we realized, interestingly, is that the moment we, everything that we had done from our side was with women. The moment we put the app on the App Store, Play Store, uh, we got a lot of men. So 45% of our users today are men. So because it was obviously open, uh, available openly. So that's how our users started to find us. Yeah. Any other questions? More questions? It's still a challenge because we are still doing it. Couple of things. One is that uh, every woman expresses a latent desire to become better with her money. Uh, she just takes a long time and she consults a lot of people on the way. And uh, everybody she consults on the way is like that, uh, is somebody who tells her, why are you doing it? Kya zarurat hai? So the, the sentence that women heard the most is kya zarurat hai? This is my discovery of my life. I am writing a book about it. Kya zarurat hai? Main to kar raha hon. Koi to kar raha hai. Papa to kar raha hai. Kya zarurat hai? So that, okay? So we realize that, so when they have that desire, so, but the, the wonderful thing is that they don't give up. They will come back, like they'll take their time and then they'll come back, then they'll ask one question, then they'll do like 200, 200 rupee investment and then they'll come back and do a 10,000 investment. So our AOVs are typically much larger because we don't give rewards and get like a high reward fueled audience. So these people come and they do things slowly and then, but then what that does is that it's slow. And when it's slow, because we live in this country where everything is on hyper growth mode, because we are a billion people and we are supposed to be the world's farm of fintech users. So it becomes uh, a little bit of a panic inducing thing, right? So that's one problem. The second problem is to make people pay. So we chose to go for the direct model of mutual fund because we believe that it it enables more transparency, that it does not lead to mis-selling because distribution leads to a lot of mis-selling and unfortunately I come from financial services so I didn't want to be a party to that. And therefore, we built the direct product. But then the direct product doesn't pay me. I don't earn commission on that. So I need to charge the client. So when we started to put money on that, like, you know, we charge 10,000 rupees for workshops, 500 rupees for one-on-one -on -one sessions, etc. cetera. Uh, we found that suddenly the interest, the funnel becomes very narrow. People still pay, we, we still do get money, but it's not as large, right? So to that extent, finding the user who's willing to pay for something which is of value, even if they're liking it, even if they're enjoying it, takes time to get to that point, right? And, and then you need a lot more hand-holding. You need to build a proper team, the team that has the right attitude to go into these communities, to stay with them for a long period of time. All of those are challenges. They're not really challenges if you're building a conventional business. There are challenges in this hyper, uh, you know, funding fueled market where actually your expectation is that you'll, you'll have a million people within, you know, a year of being in operation or something. And, and if you build it like this, then you won't. And that, that's a challenge clearly. But otherwise finding the people who find it useful because by even while we were doing all of this, we suddenly found that 300,000 people were using the passbook and 60,000 people were actually opening it more than 20 times in a month because it's a product that, uh, that has that level of engagement. And so, so, you know, that, that uh, you build that and then to monetize that is where you need to begin to plug. Probably, I think we're a little bit early to be saying what exactly will be the challenge, but yeah, that's where we are right now. Sorry. Uh, very quiet story. Was it as a first time founder, was it easy to raise funds? What was it like? 
So our, uh, when we went to, when we started the first, uh, you know, when we started at first in 2021, the liquidity was very uh, easily available in the market. Everybody was funding everything. So we did uh, raise money, but I wouldn't say that we raised it at, a, at any sort of obnoxious valuation and therefore we didn't want to dilute a lot. So we raised a certain amount of money, which has been good for us because we've been able to build a very solid technology and team with that money. So I must say I'm thankful for that. But uh, your question was, was it easy? I think, I think in, the, in, in 2021, it wasn't hard. Subsequent to that, we've done only friends and family. So yeah. So just wanted to understand first, where are we, I mean, how is my salt app, uh, you know, looking at that particular base, consumer base? And secondly, are, are we doing something to, you know, where the women uh, consumers in terms of financial literacy saving? And just the second part of it, um, how do you plan to, uh, you know, get into the underserved, unbanked uh, rural segment where we still have large population in the women base uh, who are not still literate or who are not still thinking about savings? So what, what do you do with your money? <laughs> I, I think we save first. Yeah. Uh, shop. And? Then obviously, I mean, first of all, definitely the daily expenses that you meet. Yeah. That's it. So after that, saving and shopping would come later. Okay. That's, that's basically. That's basically it, right? Yes. You Do you invest? Yes. Where do you invest? Both mutual funds, obviously, uh, po life policy, insurance and you policy. Make that, and you, you make that decision? Yes. And you do it on, your, on an app? Uh, no. You do it with your bank? Yes. Okay. So, so here's the thing, the re I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but the reason I do this is because everybody that first hears about our company, their heart and their mind goes to the poor woman, okay? And I can tell you that I, I am the daughter of that poor woman, okay? And I'm the granddaughter of that poor woman. My grandmother borrowed 50 rupees to give to my mother to leave the house and with her children and go so that she could build a life for herself, okay? So I understand how poor women think. Poor women are much better equipped to deal with their lives than rich women are. I'm sorry to say this, but this is something that you will have to start looking around. You look around and you see in your peer group how many women actually are taking financial decisions for themselves and how many of them are completely surrendering their financial autonomy to the men on various pretexts. I can write a book about 1,000 reasons women women cite to not do anything with their money. Because, you know, today is my child's birthday, today I don't have time, they will do this, they don't have my job. So what, what ends up happening is that there is a huge um, gap in wealth between men and women. Because women save, what you said, na? women save, they shop, they use money very intuitively and very, that's why we call our company salt. Because for women, money is like salt. It flows through their fingers. It's, they're always intuitive about it. What to buy, when to buy, how much to buy, what to pay. The moment it comes to investing or building wealth, they, they most of the time don't do it. I mean, you're doing it, congratulations for that. But most of the time they don't do it. And the reason, and when they don't do it, then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because then they feel very, like, you know, they, they feel very shy to admit that and to come out of it and to say that mujhe bhi karna hai. Then they kind of, I've had situations where a woman came and she said they had, she had, she was already a, a you know, investor and therefore, we tried to find her uh, PAN in the database so that we could give her an easier KYC. And then we didn't find her name. So we said, uh, you said you already have mutual funds. She said, yeah, we will have more than a crore of mutual funds. So I said, but I don't see your name. And then she called a banker. And then it turned out that the investments were in the name of her, her, her and her, you know, some company that she and her husband had created. She didn't know that. I'm not saying that that's a wrong thing or somebody has a bad intention behind it, but I'm just saying that's the level at which women live, completely under the radar when it comes to their wealth. So our purpose to build this company is to get every woman to get to that level where at least their peer men are, right? Not all men are smart with investing. Okay, guys, all of you may think that you don't need help. Please, let me tell you, you do, okay? 30 years of financial services, I know enough people, enough men making bad decisions. 
but they make the decision. The difference is that they will make bad decisions, but they'll make the decisions because they're forced to do it, and they will keep doing it, and therefore, chances are that they'll get better at it, okay? Not every woman is a good cook, right? But she'll go into the kitchen, she'll rustle up something. Over a course of her life, she might learn something, but it's possible many old women are not good cooks either. So you can keep trying it and you may never become better at it. But intuitively they won't do it. So I can, what I wanted to tell you is that we have a large population to cover. And when it comes to the rural women or the, or the women at that level, I think my personal view is that microfinance industry has done a phenomenal job of getting that woman to understand money, getting that woman to count, getting that woman to learn in her language, in her community. And I think that ecosystem is getting better and better. I would love to play a role in that, that I can, but I don't want to undermine their work by saying that that woman needs help and you know, my sister does not. My sister does. My sister only started, and my sister is a doctor. She made her first investment after I started SALT. So, yeah. Sorry, I can keep talking, guys, but I have to go. So, okay? Thank you, thank you so much.